as you know, we all celebrated Diwali, Festival of Lights on uh, October 17th. Uh, most of the Hindu worlds, uh, Sikh world, Jain world celebrate Diwali. So Jain celebrate Diwali significant is on that midnight of Amavasya, Bhagwan Mahavir left this world. So the kings and uh, people who have met there, they thought the Bhagwan Mahavir for 30 years were enlightening them all over. His light was there. So with his liberation or nirvan, let's continue the light with lightening the lamps. So they did light up the lamp to keep alive the message he has delivered for 30 years. So that's why Jain celebrate this last 24th Tirthankar or teacher of Jain tradition uh, left this world. So we will talk about his brief life first, but the main thing we want to talk about his message. Before he left this world for 48 hours, continuously he preached to the congregation or the people who were, uh, you know, uh, collect, you know, uh, gotten together over there on that day, and those. 48 hours knowledge or wisdom was later on compiled into the Uttaraya Dhanya Sutra. So we will touch base on some of this briefly, the messages he imparted. But Bhagwan Mahavir was born in 599 BC in Kundgram in Bihar to Siddharth, King Siddharth and Trisla mother. But even though he was a kind of a prince and a royal person, he did not have much, much interest in the material world. He was kind of a leaning toward ascetism. So at age 28, after his parents passed away, he told his brother that I want to leave this worldly thing and go to the meditation where all I don't have these external attractions and I can go in the peace of the forest with the nature and meditate and find what is this all world about. Even though his parents followed Jainism, and in those days it was not called Jainism, his Parents followed 23rd Jain teacher, Paswanath, which was 250 years ago, around 950 BC. His uh, tradition, which was called Chaturyami Dharma, you know, four uh, uh, Mahavrata, great vows, they followed that. But he wanted not to take the words from any other gurus or anything. He wanted to experience himself, contemplate himself, to find the answers to this life and the universe and all about. So for 12 and a half years, okay, 28th year, his brother Nandi Vardhan, he says, no, you can't leave, we are already uh, depressed with our parents gone, so he insisted to stay two years. So he stayed on two years, but at age 30, he left to the forest to meditate and find the answers. For 12 and a half years, he roamed around various places, but again, all the time, meditation, ascetic. Uh, and after 12 and a half years, he find, we call it Kevalyagnan, or you can say absolute knowledge. Then he realized 
I think, uh, if I remember right, in 4 o'clock in the morning on Rujuta River, uh, he uh, had uh, the absolute knowledge about the past, the present, and future. But the most of his knowledge was in a spiritual world because that's what he was looking the answers. So, and he was very happy and blessed. He says, if I received this bliss, if I received this knowledge, I have to share this knowledge with the people of the world so they can have the happiness because misery is always there. So he traveled all around in that region by foot. So at the end of this 12 years of meditation and yoga and contemplations and uh, deliberations, he came up with the three major discoveries. He was not a philosopher. He was not a writer or anything. He was himself as a trial. So from his understanding, he came up about this world, three major principles. From three major principles, all other things which I will talk about kind of are derived. But three major principles are thus independence, equality, and happiness. And from there, further you ex ex expand that one, then he has a nature of reality. And then fourth one was a spiritual liberation. But the first three are the major on which all this. So what the independence is, well, first thing he divided the world is a two, jiva, a jiva. There's a consciousness or jiva, living beings, and the matter. There are the two major divisions in this world. So he will talk, we will talk about and, and there's a game in between interaction with the consciousness of living with the non-living. So the, the interaction, and this is what we call it, sansar. So the life we are born, we live, we die, and the life goes on. So what he said, that all souls or all living beings are independent. They do not depend on anyone else. So that's very uh, important. Every soul is independent. Another thing says it's immortal. And third one he says indestructible. So the soul never dies, which also in Hinduism we say the same thing. So these are the fundamental principles. He says, well, soul is independent, immortal, and instructable. It is always there, and it is always will be there. Then every soul for its happiness and for his progress does not depend on anyone else. Now, in our social world, we think we depend on each other. But in ultimate reality, do not depend upon. Because we will talk about later that soul is an architect of its own destiny when it combines with the bodily, when it takes the birth. So, soul, second one, he says, souls are subject to change or subject to change, even every object of the world or universe is changing. Changing without any external interference. So that this is a law of nature. In the same way, the law of nature not only applies to the material world, but the law of nature applies to the living beings. That we are, we are never, each atom, it never created, never will be destroyed. In a way, our atma, or we can say atom, we are completely independent. And another thing, we are not alike anybody else. 
We are unique. Each soul is unique in its purest form. Then you will ask, in this world, how come everybody is different? Now the difference comes from, as we said, the transformation due to karmas. Various karmas in our previous life or whatever, that's where our changes comes. So we could be man, woman, we could be animal, the tree. Most of the time people say the only human has a life or soul. But he says, no, every living being has a soul. Now many people would say, Atma, this animals, animals don't have Atma, soul or whatever. But he gave the freedom that every living being in this world is a soul. So once this independence came, and they had their own progress way of doing the things in the world. So the, law, the laws of nature is own attributes. And that's where the definition according to Mahavir is comes, what is dharma or religion? What he says, vatu sahavo dhamma, the vastu, that's nature, it is dharma. Your attribute of each soul is dharma. So every soul's attributes are different. That's the dharma, the nature. One thing, other thing we came out with, again, is independence. Up, this is also Ardhmag, the language over there, you know. Upneva, vigneva, dueva. Upneva means integration. When the soul and the body integrates, becomes a birth, and then we have this life form we talk about, all life forms. So integration, and then disintegration, which is do, vigneva, or we can sometimes we call it death, or sometimes we call it change, transformation. And then it's a dueva. Between this integration and disintegration, there is a permanence. Permanence, dueva, is always there. So that's where the soul even though we see the person dies, we think the soul is gone. You know, soul is not gone. Soul has gone to the other journey. So again, another one thing is soul and the body, they are different. We associate the body as a soul. It's embodied. Soul is embodied in the thing. But our body without soul is material. That's why when the person dies, we cremate it, we burn it. That's not violence, you know. But uh, until the person is alive, you know, person is a, a soul. So that's the, his independence, that no interference. Everyone is independence. Now second comes the equality. All souls are alike and equal in its pure form. All souls are equal uh, and uh, alike. None is superior or none is inferior. Even though we all look different, our external form and education and our gender, they're all different, or color. But inside, the soul remains is everyone has the similar soul, unique soul. And that's the very important, the equality. Our disparity comes, which we see the difference is due to karmas. Uh, the Jain term is called pudgal. Karma and pudgal is that. So physical form and our mental diversity and all is. But all in one, one in all. And we have a good... Uh, Hindu phrase is Tattva Masi. I mean, it's the same uh, thing. Third thing, it comes out to happiness. Every soul loves happiness. Nobody wants misery, pain. So if you, do, as an individual, if you do not want the pain, how can you give the pain to others? If you love yourself, you cannot take away the pleasure of other people. And that's where 
his principle of non-violence comes or ahimsa comes, that if I want to be happy, I don't want to make another person unhappy or other one. So, <coughs> everyone loves happiness. Now, beings or living beings are miserable, particularly human beings are miserable due to their own faults. Think about this. Living beings are miserable due to their own faults because we have a wrong assumptions about the happiness. We are trying, human beings are trying to find the happiness in the material world. Happiness owning the things, happiness enjoying the food and everything, which it, and then also unsatiable desires which cannot be satisfied. And when something is not satisfied, we can become unhappy. So what he's saying that the human beings are, we all love happiness at the same time, so ahinsa comes. The other one says, we, our, due to our faults, because our wrong understanding that happiness comes from the outside. So third thing comes, comes out, he says, the bliss or happiness does not come from outside, it's happiness within within ourselves. So there's three legged things, uh, independence, equality, and happiness. And then comes the nature of reality. What is real? <clears throat> First thing he found out from his meditation, nothing is supernatural. There is a cause and effect. There is no magic. Things do not happen out of nothing. So from this one he says, nothing is supernatural or superhuman or out of nothing. <clears throat> so what he's saying that in order to know yourself, understand and realize your true self. He thought that we are two births. One birth is from our mother or parents. That's our material birth. But the second birth comes when we find ourselves who really we are. He terminates the death. Second birth, realizing ourselves is the most important part. That's why many times the question comes out, who am I? Why I am here? So those kind of a questions when we interpret, we understand, then we have this second birth. And he has said that thing, our soul is permanent, our body is not permanent. Since we are born in a way we are dying every day, indirectly. Because as you see, the, the, the curve, you know, how youthfulness, and then we go through the cycle, we become the old, and then we are gone. And that applies not only to human beings, it applies to all the life. The duration could be different. The trees may be living thousands of years and things like that. But we, in a human, animal world, the giant is, a, you know, uh, they gone through this meditation. There were no instruments in those days. We are talking 3,000, 5,000 years back. But here comes there are, there are Jeeves in all these five elements of the earth, which is an earth, water, fire, wind, and space. So there are Jeeves all around. Those are single cells. And then even the trees. Trees as a life. Vegetation world has a life. And it was proven scientifically what maybe 150 years ago, Jagdish Chandra Bose, Dr. Jagdish Chandra Bose says, yes, they have the feelings. For we, we have to go beyond that. This, this, this world has an intelligence. 
the trees and the plants of any uh, intelligence. Just think about it. When that seeds or roots go in the ground, darkness, soil and everything, sooner or later with its power energy burst through and it grows and becomes a tree and gives the shade and the colors and fruits and all usefulness. So what is another thing he's saying? We are all interdependent. We human beings, we have received so much. We are all interdependent on each other. Which, which is interconnectedness with the plant world, animal world, and the human world. So the single cells or single sense, two sense there are many animals, three sense many animals, four sense, and we as a mammals of five senses. And another thing many people, we, many people say, hey, we human has a mind. Yes, we have mind. I think animal has a mind too. Animal has intelligence too. They may not be able to speak the way we speak and we have done that. But they have feelings, the feelings we talked about before, but they have intelligence. I have seen, I'm sure you all have studied many in animal kingdoms, how much intelligence many of these animals, and they are our good friends. We use them for various purposes. So, the, the, that's it where the principle in our India develop vegetarianism. Find the alternate. How can you hurt the animals, no matter how small or how big that is? The who will have pain, just like I will have pain, somebody freaking. How can you kill the animal for your food? There are many alternatives. Even though plant life is a, uh, what you call it, life, but you are not killing the plant life, you are using the uh, grains and whatever, and the crops and fruits, and so on and so forth. So, there is a violence in the nature. But our, as a human being, with our interconnectedness, we minimize the violence. So minimize the violence, we can use the f food, which is the plant-based, not animal-based. Animal is a hierarchy, much more sensible. Three, four cents, two cents, three cents, four cents, or five cents, you know, also. And they also mind, feeling, and so on. So the ahinsa, nonviolence, became prevalent uh, with, you know, in earlier times, I'm sure you heard the stories and everything, people to satisfy the God used to sacrifice the animals. And that was no, no. And that's where it all stopped way back when, and then uh, in India, vegetarianism. Uh, spread. Not all, everybody is, but at least 50% in India is vegetarian, is there. And now I think that they are taken one step. See, this is a, life is a change. You can't stick back to the 5,000 years. Now there's a veganism. All around the world is spreading. Where you do not want to have even dairy products. Because where the dairy comes from, because in old time it was a necessity for our survival and everything, and uh, cows were being killed, and then in order to protect them, they, they made it sacred and all that. But the other, see, this, this, we as a human are discriminatory. Whichever we love, we accept them that they are loving them. For all other things, we discard them. Jane says, no, you cannot have discriminatory uh, nonviolence or discriminatory law. One thing you like or use it, you don't do harm to it. The other one, you do not care about it. You take care of them. So the, the, the ahinsa should be applied universally. So uh, it is unfortunate that still in India, on even religious basis, the violence is carried on. For example, on um, the Sarah. Uh, in, uh, in Bengal, religious places uh, they kill, which is uh, still that thing, can, maybe it's only one day, it used to be long, many, many days, but this is one day, but still this is in our mindset, 
that yeah, that's okay to satisfy the goddess or god or whatever. Uh, that has to be stopped, you know. And in many places, discriminately uh, kill the animals for hunting, the pleasure, and so on and so forth. That is not necessary for our pleasure. He already said the pleasure doesn't come from outside. Pleasure comes from your inside. Uh, within, it lives in it. So, the ahimsa, this we talked about physical ahimsa. But he went beyond that thing, that ahimsa is, starts in the thought process in one's mind. Our ideas and thoughts. And thoughts sometimes take the form in words, anger, and then ultimate, you hurt physically, an action. So, he wants to work in order to minimize that thing, start with the mindset, the thought process. We should have not have a thought process to hurt anyone. So you don't want to hurt anybody, not even think about it, not even say bad words about him or her, and even not act physically, or not even other ways. So the ahimsa has a tremendous impact. Now, so this is kind of an individual level, but then also at the community level, there were many of our traditions were there, and everybody was saying, my way of life or my thinking is right only, not yours. Your God is no good, or your God is inferior, something like that. So there was ideological things were going on. Bhagavan Mahavi thought that we are all individuals, we all have our own intelligence, we all think differently, and we do not have a total pick with our physical limitations. We do not have a complete picture of the reality, what is real. So there could be a truth in my word, some truth. It could be in your word or somebody else's word. And we have to respect the truth, partial truth, whatever that is. But in order, you can, and we already said no superiority or absolutism. And that kind of a, is path to keep everyone in a peaceful, uh, conciliatory manner. So he devised this called anekantavad, multiple point of view or multi-sidedness. And that's very true. With our physical limitations, uh, we cannot see the total reality. So how can we say that you are right and you are wrong and I am right, you know, you are wrong. So that's why you have to evaluate all the possible things to come up with the solutions. So the Anikatva today in the world, we're coming back to how can we use his philosophy. Today's world, you have multiple religions, multiple nations, indirectly nationalism, uh, many communities, uh, many different color people. Uh, so, so this Superiority complex is ego complex and pride and greed is creating and everyone uh, this problem. So to anekant, understand the others. So other word is the tolerance. We have to develop the tolerance with each other, with each other religion. You cannot say my religion is the superior, my God is the superior, or my religious book is the only book. So that's to intolerance is too much in the world, and that intolerance is creating the wars, the violence. And we see that thing. It's going on from long, long time and still not solved, but this kind of a philosophy or this kind of a tradition, we have to experience and put in our practice to solve this thing. Anekant, multiple point of view. And your point of view, you may be right. And your point of view, you may be right. But maybe we can come to some understanding so we can live together. We can understand each other. And this is the world, where in a way, we are going for a still our primordial or selfishness still dominates the world, and that's why we have war all over. We have a greed 
So I'll come back to this other one, his, uh, you know. We have agreed to acquire more and more things. And to, to acquire more and more things, you take away the rights of others, you take away the right, properties of others. That's where the war came, the colonialism came, and so on and so forth. So since about 100 years now, the democracies have developed all around the world. But our democracy is just, uh, you know, it's not full democracy. It's by the laws and everything, everybody agrees. But the internal basis, the democracy, true democracy, is, is not there yet. And that's we see all over the world. There's some places a communism, where by force they dictate the laws. Some places a kingship, uh, dictators, uh, they all are there. So, so we have to have this tolerance uh, develop with each other. Now comes the spiritual freedom. Everyone has a right to live and everyone has a right to declare or attain the liberty. So there, you know, even in U.S. Constitution or U.S. as a Constitution, the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It's, it's already written in that thing. So if you look at the life, we have right to live. Liberty, we should have freedom to act whatever way we like without hurting others or taking away the others' rights. And happiness. It's the same thing spiritually we take that action, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So the liberty ultimate is liberty of what? Liberty is the freedom from our weaknesses. Freedom from attachments, freedom from the desires, freedom to treat everyone equal in this world. Now, some of the, in the last 48 hours, uh, he said, there are four things in this life are difficult. One thing is the human life, human birth. Human birth is hard to get. Human life is precious because this is where you can get the liberation once you are in the human life. Because you have mind, you can develop, you can meditation, you can go inside within yourself uh, and find it. And what's the other one? Hard to get is the true precepts of religion. Knowledge, true knowledge, true guru. It's very hard to get. Let's say you found the guru, you found the knowledge, you understood the thing. The hard to get is a convinced of such knowledge. We have all kinds of knowledge in our scriptures and every places. We don't follow that thing. We don't follow in our life. So third one is, is even though we have all the knowledge, uh, and the fourth one is, to put it into practice. That's the hardest part. All these philosophers and spirituals over the centuries have given us the message of life, but we don't put into practice. So those are the four things. Another one he says, Samyam Goyam Ma Pramadaye. His uh, disciple, chief disciple was Gautam Swami, and uh, he was a very knowledgeable person, but he was not getting absolute knowledge. So he was, Mahavir preaching him, Gautam, Samyam Goyam, the time is moving, time is irreversible. Do not waste the time. Not waste the time means no pramad. You introspect, you act on it, pulsat, acting you have to do, which he did, but still he was not. There was some problem, and Mahavir knew that. So, because Gautam Swami, or chief disciple, has a tremendous attachment to Mahavir, whatever he was preaching and everything. 
and Mahavi knew due to his attachment. So he said, Gautam, you have crossed the river. You have crossed the river of the sansar with the flowing, the knowledge and everything. For you are clinging to the shore. You are clinging to the shore. Shore means Mahavir. Let him go. Once he realized, and after Mahavir's Nirvan, on that midnight uh, Amavasya, in the morning, when he heard the news, he was crying and weeping and everything. Then somebody else, another Gandhar came and he gave the message of Bhagwan Mahavir. Once he got that message, he realizes and he let that attachment go and he got this Kevalagnan or absolute knowledge. So that's why uh, we call that as a new year, you know, in a, in a, Jain, you know, it's a new year. By the way, Bhagwan Mahavish Nirvan, the Veer Savant started, the earliest calendar in India, age of Veer Savant, Mahavish death, they started this new year, new era at that time. Nowadays, uh, we have so many calendars in India, in at least Gujarat and Western part called Vikram Savant, which is, uh, you know, uh, 2074 uh, this year. But the Bhagwan Mahavish years goes to 2575, you know that many years back. Anyway, so, so he developed the system. Again, another one was my equality of, the, the equality of each soul. There is no inferior, no superior. So he encouraged anybody can attain the liberation. Anybody can attain uh, the moksha. There is a liberty. You do not have to be a high caste or you don't have to be Brahmin. So he did not believe in the caste system or Varna Veda. He did not believe that. He did not believe in the differences, spiritual differences between man and woman. All genders. Anybody can attain. That's why in the Jain we have a sadhus and sadhvis from Mahavish time. Chandanwala, who was a slave, who was also downcast, she became the chief nun at that time, Bhagwan Mahavish time, and still the tradition of ladies or sadhvis. As a matter of fact, in Jain religion, more sadhvis than sadhus. Yes, more sadhvis, more nuns than uh, male monks, you know. So that tradition is still going on, uh, still. Uh, and anybody at a any age, you can attain the liberation. Only thing you have to be ready for uh, that. So he developed a code of conduct for sadhu and sadhvis, which are called five great vows or five mahavrat. So whatever the philosophy and principle we talked about, so now is a kind of a code of conduct. Earlier Jain had a ahinsa, a satya, or satya, not to lie not to steal, acharya, and uh, also a parigraha, not to consume uh, many, many things or collect many, many things, a parigraha, attach, this attachment. And five one he added brahmacharya, celibacy. Now this is for sadhu and sadhvis. So earlier Jain tradition had a four, that's why it was called chaturyami dharma. He added this fifth one. Now this is for sadhu and sadhvis. So sadhu and sadhvi, when they take a diksa or sannyas, they leave everything and they, you know, roam with other sadhus and they depend on the society. But they have very minimum, other than few clothing, other than few utensils and some uh, thing, that's all. And they move from one location to other location. They don't have house, they don't have bank account, they don't have a uh, cell phone or anything like that. Uh, they don't. They are pursuing the path of. At the same time, whatever they are doing, of course they are depending upon society for minimum meal requirement, minimum clothing requirement, minimum books or requirements. They indirectly give back to the society by preaching, to showing the message of uh, uh, dharma, religion, uh, to become a liberated. 
to try to get them that you find your real self rather than you associate. Many times we associate ourselves, our outer persona, how other people perceive us. That's what most of the people are looking for. Or we have a so-called dual personality. We don't look who really we are, we look how the other people. And many times, general public, our actions are based on how the other feels or how others uh, perceive us and so on and so forth. So we do not follow the real instinct how the life should be because we are governed by the so-called majority. So he's saying, Anandi, Bhagavan Mahavi says, you do not have to listen to my message. You act, you experience yourself and then find yourself what you want. Not necessarily what I took the path would be good for you. So that's why this it gives the freedom to choose which path, which way you want to go. And that's very important. We have to come out of, we as an intelligent mind, we have to ask the question of all these theories from Sastras. Is it true? Is it real? Is it okay? We got to ask ourselves. We do not have to take it or accept it without trying it without challenging it. So that's, it's an intelligent mind, uh, inquiring mind. If you want to search ourselves, we got to go into meditation and ask these questions. And change, once we have the knowledge, then our mode of living will change or transform. Because what has happened since our birth, we took many of the things from our parents, we took from the teacher and school, which is a general knowledge about the world. Nobody told us about the life in, uh, other than few good teachers. Most of them they taught you English or history or geography or math. But they did not teach us the life lessons in the schools. That comes from the, for the reading the scriptures or good books, or it comes from the sant or saints, those who are lecturing. Now these many saints are there, many gurus are there. Nowadays a lot of doubts in India about these gurus, the behave, behavior they are doing in the public and everything. So that's why it's very important to find the proper guru. And if you don't find the proper guru or teacher, meditate and question. And it should be with some framework of the principles, test them and then act them in your life. But it comes down to it, your happiness depends, you know your experiences. When we were a child, we were happy with the candies and laddus and pandas and all those things, you know. As we are growing up, those things are kind of a secondary. When we were, you know, nowadays the kids get the toys, you know, toys, he will change the mind, he or she. I go to the grandchildren. They have so many toys, you know. They may not like, just look at it, that thing, they change the mind. Sometimes they play with the very simple things they enjoy. The utensils in the drawer, mom has that thing. They enjoy more than all highly technical things. So this change. But at the same time, as we grow, our desires, our ideas of happiness keep changing. So that means those are impermanent. So somewhere on the line, we have to find the permanent happiness. Now question is, what is permanent happiness? Which is within. Now, our scriptures are saying, of course, you train yourself, you uh, grow yourself. At the same time, it's your duty to give back. Give back to the society. Give back to others without selfish motive. As soon as you do the selfish, again, another thing before I go further into this, Bhagavan Mahavi summed up the religion in one or two words. As a matter of fact, one word, raga, attachments, liking and non-liking. So liking is a rag and non-liking is a uh, aversion, dwesh. So when you don't like something, 
you hate it or you discard it and everything, and you like it, you are attached to it. You are more and more. Whether it's good or not, without, for whatever you like, you want to use it more, more and more and more, and you're asking. And non like, you just discard it. So these two were rag and waste. So the whole idea, if you really want to improve and be happy, is if we cut down a rag or attachments for the things, and dwes, it's the same thing, you know, non, you know. If you cut down that thing, minimize that thing, automatically we will be cutting down the violence. Violence to ourselves and violence to others. Many times we do a lot of violence to ourselves. How? How so? Not hitting, you know, by that, but by getting wrong foods, which may not be good for ourselves. That's, that's very, because our body depends on the right foods. You know, cause and effect, many times it's, you know, it's cause and effect works. No previous karmas are all going to take away your life, but we ourselves could be responsible for your early or whatever, uh, uh, some of the pains we can have. Uh, uh, also, I, I just lost my uh, thought here, ten process, what I was trying to say. Oh, rag and waste. So if you can minimize the rag and waste, so also the violence. Would. But then also he said, you know, we all have four bad negativities. And I will sum up a short word called aged. Anger. G, greed. E, ego, and D, deceit. So in the Jain uh, language, it's called kasaya. And one idea is to get rid of or minimize those four kasais. So the worst kasai is greed. Greed is the father of all these negativities. Just think about it, greed. What greed has done to this world. Greed has done to wars and everything, all those uh, violence and everything, and colonialism, slavery, uh, all these things are, comes from the greed, and greed still goes on. And uh, you know, even current world, this may be the richest country in the world and everything, but the greed is a powerful motive and keeping only, think about it, less than 1%, 1% of the populace and the highest amount of money in this world and here this country, one person only. Rest of, even though we are living better and everything, amass those one percent of the people. And I'm sure I'm not going to go into politics, but my point is this greed is the source of most of the violence in this world. And then so many times the ego, ego of our race, Ego of our religion, ego of our God, ego. That means superiority, superiority complex. Uh, uh, people feel about the fairness. Ego of the man versus woman. Even though in our religious, we uh, you know, uh, accepted a goddess is along with a God, but we have treated women very badly. Not only in India, but all over the world, women have been treated badly. Even in this democratic world, still women are indirectly are, are kind of uh, used or not equal or not paid equal. So this, before I talk of equality of the souls, but I think equality we have to treat every human being same, which includes the women. There should not be any difference in the color, whether black, white, or brown, or yellow. There should not be that. So in today's world, Bhagwan Mahavi's message about this, but the most another message is ecology. Bhagwan Mahavi said that in all natural world, the water, earth, all have a life into it. We all depend on each other. We as a human being have received so much from all this world, animal world, kingdom world. Why can't we treat them as a our friends, not destroy them, minimize the use. So 
The Aparigra, I take another one of the element of the five Vrata is, as far as the lay person like us, sadhu sadhus, they are doing utmost Aparigra. But as a, as, a, as a human being, which we have the resources and we have the material, limit on our desires or indirectly we say limit on our wastage or use. That comes to ecology, conservation of the resources. Indirectly, it comes from it. Vegetation. Uh, that's why right now the issue, big issue is the uh, plants, uh, world's resources. So, I will sum it up. Okay, I will leave some que you know, question and answer. I will sum it up. Ahinsa, tolerance or anekant, Aparigraha, which can sum up into the liberation uh, of the world, resources saving, ecology, uh, so that. But on a personal basis, meditate. meditate. Yoga and meditation is kind of go hand in hand. Once your body is proper, then you can meditate. Meditation is important for our peace of mind. We are so much tangled up with the outside world, hazel dazzle. Spend at least minimum 15 minutes in meditation. Bhagwan Mahavira spent days and days and nights in the meditation to find himself. I think we can do, start with 15 minutes, we can increase that length in meditation. Meditation don't have to, I mean you can do with the recitation of the mantras and everything. It should be really in the mind uh, thinking. Don't have to be a concentration. It should be a free flow. Do not have to worry about the outside world. That's why you close the eyes. Do not have to listen to the music, outside world. The whole idea is to get away from the outside world, go inside. Your inside is a tremendous, subconscious mind is a tremendous thing. In that one, uh, meditation is, Hinduism is there, Jainism is there. But in Buddhism, there is a meditation called Vipassana. And that's a 10-day course. If you're not taking a 10-day course, it just will open up your mind and heart. Uh, you, once you have gone through that training, you will be a completely different person. You will look at the world uh, differently. So, as a Mahavir's world, as a total world, you know, it's a uh, ahinsa at all levels, a parigra, uh, anekant, treat others same as you want to be treated others. But as a personal level, go find oneself, yourself, who you really are. And I think once we go to that knowledge, we don't need outside interference. Of course, you can depend on yourself. You have a, one thing about human power or human individual so unique, so much talent and power. We are not using our brain, we are using 3 to 4%. If we go to this meditation, who knows this, this teachers in the past and many rishis, when they meditated, we know what they might have opened up their mind, percentage of brain, we don't know that. But it can be a direct result of this meditation to develop one's ability to know. With that one, I wish you all and I would be entertain any questions or comments you may have. I have one question. I probably missed it. Uh, yes, go then. The 48-hour discourse, uh, and, you know, Mahavir said about four things which are difficult. Yes. Which is that I got to three of them, I think. Human life is hard to get. True knowledge is hard to get. Put it into practice is hard. What is the fourth one? No, the, the third one is to get it convinced. Oh, to get it and a fourth one is to put to practice. Okay. The knowledge, to get the knowledge, you got to get convinced. There is knowledge all over the knowledge. How do you get convinced that that's the right path? Get to convince yourself or whatever. Convinced that it is the right path for you or is it for the world or what is it? For you too. I think again we are talking about oneself here. One this is a one spiritual thing. Uh, what are you talking about? Okay. The soul, yeah. And fourth one is to put in your practice. Even after you're convinced, even after we know we don't follow many times, you know. Because that's our lethargy or that's our, some, some kind of pramad. Uh, we 
The important point is time, because you know what? Death is a mystery. You do not know, or one does not know, when that would come. Even though we know the life is our, our, our atma, it never dies and all thing, but current embodied self, we do not know. We know, know, we know only the present. The past is gone. We don't know the future. So the, another message is live in the present the best creative way we can live in the present. Don't worry about whatever happened. See, that's, the way, that's, that's where comes the principle of forgiveness. Suppose somebody has done wrong to us and everything. You know, again, it's connected with Ahinsa. Forgive, forget, and move on. That's the, you know, uh, very beautiful. Because many times people are suffering from this past. And many times people are worrying about the future. What will happen tomorrow? What will happen there? Well, you know. When you are doing meditation, meditation is a very difficult thing. When you shut your eyes, when you go, your mind is such a monkey, you will think about many other things which you were... When your eyes were open, you were not thinking. But once you go in meditation, you will be thinking about what happened to that and that. Mind is such a powerful energy. It can jump from the, the way time you are born to so many years, or you can go other way uh, in the future. So the mind to calm it down to this mind is the initial process for the meditation. So coming back to this, uh, we would be very happy if we live in the present. Use this moment what we got very fruitfully. Uh, that's also uh, his message. Uh, even though he lived only to 72 years, his life, but the message for 30 years, he never stopped. He just moved and they give the message. And uh, uh, also, you know, in a conventional saying is that, you know, your life is determined when you were born, the year you were born, then you were died, and there is a little dash between. There is a dash between. We have to think not the beginning, not the end. We have to think about the dash. Dash is a current. That means life. Dash is a star. Signing star. How did we sign? What did we sign? We should look at that. The star, we should look at that. And not those end uh, dates. Because it's a life. It's a cycle. We'll keep going on and on and on. The journey. The journey will continue. And Diwali, the message is uh, getting rid of darkness. Darkness is a mithyatva, you know. Mithya, mithyatva. And that comes from the knowledge and the conviction and practice or acharan, action. And purusarth, you know, many times people depend some other third, you know. Uh, I agree, the, we come for the um, puja and everything, that's good. Those are for our message. We get the uh, blessing, but at the same time we get the message that, hey God, we want to be just like you. We are not come here to get the material things to give us. Give us the power and energy so we become just and we become free. So I think if we, if we use that, the means what is available, uh, we can go back. But if we said, whatever God will do, it will do, we don't do pursat, you know, nasib. You know, many times we have, you know, you know fate. Nasib doesn't work. 
you got to do the pursat action. Nobody else will do for you. Not even your wife or not even children. You have to do yourself. Pursat. Also, the things, there are four things. The things change according to Dravya, Kal, Pradesh, and, uh, and uh, Bhav. So any action we should look at, because of many times whatever things could be in India could be different, because this is a time is different, the Pradesh means a place where you are is different, and Bhav means your perception is different, and the, really the material, the Dravya, it could be different. So when we do some of the acts, we should look at these four things, you know, examine with the four things. Uh, before we base our decision, uh, we should. Uh, uh, the life is nothing but the purification for ourselves. Because many times we have many disbeliefs have been either whatever, wherever we grew up and everything, have been bombarded in ourselves or misunderstood to try and find out the right path from the whatever beliefs we have been you know injected in and this media nowadays or whatever they give you throw you you don't know what is right or wrong things or whatever consumerism the products they are using use 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 while the, our message of Bhagavan Mahavir and most of it is resist do not waste minimize not too many desires. So we, our, our, you know, spiritual philosophy is kind of a little bit away, or it's a 180 degree from this consumerism or capitalism or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, this true spirituality. Wish you the best spiritual life on your way. Thank you very much.